All right, if you'll take your Bibles and join me in Matthew chapter number 7. Somebody asked, preacher, how long will you be in the book of Matthew? As long as it takes. Uh, we are doing a, uh, not, not a, a summary of the book of Matthew, we're doing a verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Matthew, and that takes a little bit longer to do that. Uh, especially what we've been looking at over the last several weeks, we've been looking at the, what's called the Sermon on the Mount. And these are the first recorded teachings of Jesus. If you'll notice, everything in the last uh, couple services we've had is in red. Okay, that means this is Jesus teaching. And so uh, if this is what he leads off his ministry teaching, I would dare say it's important. Amen? Uh, and so... Uh, it is important. Last week we looked at judging others and we saw it in the proper context. Uh, I told you a lot of people love that verse. So you can't judge me. The Bible says not to. Well, if you read it into the context, that's not exactly what it says. And as we get further down in chapter 7, we'll, we'll prove that again to you. All right. Well, as we begin our passage today, Jesus returns to the subject of prayer that he addressed over in chapter number 6. And at first you might think that it's out of context, but as we look at it, it really follows a natural progression. If you'll remember last week we talked about removing the log out of our eye in order to we might uh, be able to help uh, our brothers and sisters remove the speck out of their eye. We've got to deal with self first before we can deal with them. Well, if we're going to give our brothers and sisters and ourselves the proper spiritual guidance, uh, we need that guidance. Well, where does that guidance come from? It comes through prayer. Uh, and we're not just talking about a quick prayer. Uh, how many of you pray over your meals? How many of you do it because that's your habit and that's what you're supposed to do? How many of you have ever started eating? Uh, I'll prove this to you. How many of you have ever started eating and then you got worried you were going to choke on that chip because you forgot to say your prayer? Let's be honest, Amen. All right, that tells us it's out of habit, okay? Uh, which brings up another thing. This is, this is just extra. I'm just throwing this in there for you. Something for you to ponder this week. Some deep spiritual thought needs to be put into this. Do we need to pray over leftovers? Well, I prayed over them once, right? So, anyway, take that home with you and chew on it for a little while. Get it? Chew on it? All right, never mind. Let's move on. All right, uh, but we're talking about a persistent prayer. Uh, have you ever asked yourself uh, why some people seem to succeed in having their prayers answered and others don't? Why some have a greater understanding of the Bible than others? Why some seem to reach more souls for Christ than others? You ask yourself, is it a skill? Uh, is it genius or is it just plain luck? Well, I think Calvin Coolidge uh, shines some light on the answer when he said this. He said, press on. Nothing in the world can take the place of perseverance. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than an unsuccessful man with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. So we're talking about not only prayer, but we're talking about persistence in prayer. Uh, and then Jesus is going to tell us or show us uh, that by two things, looking at uh, the uh, virtue of the perseverance uh, in this prayer area, and it's going to break it up into really two different sections, okay? I know we're normally supposed to have three points alliterated, all that fun stuff. I just got two for you this morning. How many are you excited because you get to go home early with two points? Don't be, okay? Uh, in this passage, we're going to see the precept and we're going to see the promise of perseverance in prayer. So if you will, we're down in chapter number 7. <clears throat> Excuse me, down at verse uh, 7. It says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Okay? So we begin here with the precept uh, that we see, and we see the invitation there. Addison, I think you took me over there. 
just click on the screen. All right, there we go. All right, and so we begin with the invitation. You just got to keep up with me this morning. Don't fall asleep back there. All right. First of all, he tells us three things, three precepts that we need to know here. We need to ask. By the way, that's in the present tense. If you've done any Greek study, that means you're to ask and you're to keep on asking. Okay? It's not just a one-time ask. You ask and you keep on asking. We are to seek also in the present tense. We're to seek and we're to do what? Keep on seeking. And then we are to knock. If in that, again, in the present tense, we're going to knock and keep on knocking. Now, before we go any further, I don't want you to miss the obvious implication of this verse. Listen to me, church. God wants to hear from you. Doesn't God know everything that's going on in our life? Doesn't he know what we want? Doesn't he know what we need? Doesn't he know all these things that we're bringing to him? Of course he does. But it tells us that he wants to hear from us. So we need to be asking. We need to be seeking. We need to be knocking. <coughs> well, then we go to the intensification. Have you ever stopped to notice the progression of the terms Jesus uses here? Asking. This is the first level of inquiry. Simply asking a question. Okay? Uh, if I go to Woody and I say, Woody, uh, where do you live? All right, I've asked the question, correct? First step. The second step is seeking, okay? Uh, and that suggests that there's another step after the, the asking. Now we go and find the answer that we're looking for, okay? He tells me where he lives. Guess what I have to go do now? I have to find it. I have to seek it, okay? Um, and so we do that. And notice here that action plus, or asking plus action. So we've added two different steps and then the knocking. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure that he's going to appreciate when I find his house if I knock on his door. Amen? I'm pretty sure I'm going to appreciate the fact that I knocked on the door because if I just barge, barge in that door, I'm liable to get shot. Just thinking. All right? Uh, you know, that same thing with me. You know, Peggy Buchanan got me in trouble a couple months ago on Facebook. She posted this thing that said, if, if we were to break into your house and get, look on top of your refrigerator, what would I get? And I said, shot. You'd get shot. <laughs> I was just answering honestly. Well, Facebook banned me for like 24 days because evidently they didn't want my opinion on that. But anyway, so now, now so we, it intensifies. We go from the asking to the seeking to the knocking and so it's the action <coughs> or the action plus the action plus perseverance all right the persistence the progression through these steps will reveal the true desire we have for the answer that we're looking for now if I ask him where he lives but I don't ever do anything with that information how many think I really cared where he lived all right so we see that as I studied through this I'm reminded of um, yeah, most of you know, I, I, I tip, piddle in a little bit of everything. And that's always because I've been a pretty inquisitive person. I want to know how things work. When I was younger, a little kid, I had this gorilla. And the gorilla had a, a radio in it. You know, you had a volume switch and a tuner. For those of you that are young, that tuner, that's what you had to dial to find. In a, you heard, shh, and then every now and then you'd find a radio station. All right, I know you younger crowd, y'all don't understand that anymore. Now you just tell it, Siri, play whatever, and it plays whatever. Amen? That, that's how we work on things now. Um, my kids, I know, I, I, I tell them, they say, uh, yeah, oh, oh, I pay for a subscription to that. I'm like, why? Because I don't have to listen to commercials. Really? I, I ain't going to pay money so I don't have to listen to a commercial. How many just commercials you don't even hear them anymore? If you grew up, everything had commercials. You just ignore them, amen? And, and on TV, if you don't have a commercial, when do you go to the restroom? Amen. See, when you're getting older, those, those commercials become important, amen? I remember I was watching a, a thing on, on one of the, the streaming channels a couple months ago, and it didn't have commercials. 
I said, man, I, I, I got to hit pause. There's no commercial. I can't, you know, I'm getting old, all right? So that's just what happens. So those of you that aren't my age yet, it's coming. So don't go ahead and laugh at me, but it's coming, okay? But I, would, I wanted to know how this thing worked. And so I'd get in there, and I'd, you know, the, the asking, how does this work? The seeking, guess what I did? I took it apart. Had a zipper on the back that you could access it to change the battery. Well, I got the whole radio out of that joker. I want to know how this thing works. How is this gorilla singing to me? And then, of course, I'd break it. <coughs> so my dad, he'd come and put the gorilla back together again. Radio's fine. Everything's fine. All right, so I've asked. I've seek. Guess what I do now? I still want to know how that thing works. I found out how to keep it from working, but I didn't find out how it worked. So anybody want to guess what I did again? I took it apart again. And we followed this process several times until finally I, he couldn't put it back together again. Or at least he told me he couldn't put it back together again. Now being a dad, he probably could have, but it was more like I'm not going to put it back together again because you're just going to take it apart again. But you see the progression? I went from asking to seeking to pers persistence, knocking. Okay? That's what Jesus says. When, when we, our prayer life ought to center around those three things. And if we really want something, we will persist in asking for it. Amen? Everybody with kids or grandkids, when they want something, how many times are they going to ask? Until you give it to them or beat them, whichever comes first. <laughs> and then sometimes after you spank them, then they'll come back with it again. That's persistence. All right? So that's the precept. That's the invitation. Jesus says, be asking, be seeking, be knocking continually. Well, then we come to the wonderful part, and that's the promise. In verses 7 and 8, we see the reward. Look, it says, ask, and what? It's going to be given to you. He says, everyone who asks receives. He says, seek, what's going to happen? He said, you will find it. The one who seeks will find. He says, knock. And it will be open. Why? To the one who knocks, it will be open. <coughs> Sounds simple enough, right? Why do we struggle so much with it? I mean, we look at things we're, we're not receiving, we're, we're not finding, we're not having the door open. That means we've missed somewhere when those steps, because he promises those things will happen. And then in verses 9 through 11, he gives us the reasoning behind that. You know, it's not just because whatever we ask, genie, uh, God is some genie in a, in a bottle, we rub it, we ask it, we receive it. That's not what he's promising here. Why would God make such a promise? The answer is simple, and it's the word love. He loves us. He's going to give us what we have need of because he loves us. God delights in giving good things to his children. Now, I don't know about you, but I, 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 when Christmas time comes around, I love Christmas. It's not because of what I receive, because most of the time as we get older, we don't really care what we receive, do we? It's about watching the kids open presents. And even my kids, you know, now that they're older, you know, it, they're, they, you know it's, it's bigger things. But just love being able to watch them. I love being able to give, and I love being able to provide for my children. Why? Because it shows me that they still need me. How many of you are glad to know when your children still need you? Now, we're going to fuss about it, amen? We're going to fuss about it. We're going to make a big deal about it. But we're happy about it. Why? Because they need us. God delights in helping us. You know why we keep helping our children even though they're grown and moved out? And remember, that was their idea, right? Man, I can't wait till I can get out of this place. I can do whatever I want. I can finally be on my own. How long did that last? That first unexpected bill came in, amen? That being on the loan, what this, what, it wasn't all it was cracked up to be, Amen? How many got out on your own and say, hey, mom, dad, uh, you didn't tell me this part. I was talking to some folks the other day over at the store. We were talking about education and stuff and talking about the things they teach in school. And I think they were talking about um, uh, the Pythagorean theorem or something like that. He says, I don't know when I've ever used that. 
He said, why, why don't they? I know some of y'all never use it because when I said that word, you went, huh? You do remember Pythagorean theorem? All right. It ain't been that old that far back. Right, I'm going to tell you, except for Sam, who does some engineering stuff. I don't know what he does, but complicated. He, he makes my simple things complicated. First year, I put him in charge of Kids Fest, the, the outside activities. I said, Sam, you got there to decide what you want and tell me what you need and we'll help you get it. <coughs> I think he brought in this drone from outer space. <laughs> took pictures of the property and measured from here to here and this angle to that angle to this and this. And I'm looking at his piece of paper. I said, Sam, I got a better idea. I said, you just tell me when you need me. Because we were setting up an obstacle course. He said, well, how would you do it? I'd say... That looks like a good place for one. That looks like a good place for one. He's got it drawn out, measurements and everything. Uh, by the way, how many know we need people like that? Amen? All right, but, but most of us aren't going to use those kind of things in life. Now, what they ought to be teaching is how to balance a checkbook, how to watch out for your credit, all the, how to change your oil, all these fun things. That's what they need to be teaching. But our kids realize when they leave, they still need us, and we still provide for them. Why? Because of love. Jesus uses this parental love to illustrate his concept. He says, if your child asks you for bread, which one would give him a rock? And we're not talking about your burnt biscuits. If he asks for bread, you're not going to give him a rock. Amen? I've seen some folks back here laughing about burnt. It's, it, that, I know why. I'm going to share this. This is just for them. Some of y'all understand. This is just for them. My wife the other day decides she's going to cook some bread. She's got the bread in the oven. And I walk in the house. I said, what's that smell? And she says, oh, my goodness, I made Deborah Brown toast. <laughs> Amen? But if you ask for bread, how many you give your kid a rock? You give them bread. If they ask for fish, he said, you don't give them a snake. You give them fish. And then he says, if you being evil. Y'all didn't like that part, did you? How many consider yourself evil? We're all evil. Apart from the grace and mercy of God, we're all what? If God were to look on us without the blood of Jesus Christ, what would he see? You know, there's a lot of things we have to overcome to do the right thing. Our sinful nature is innately evil. Okay, that, that's just how we respond to things. So he said, you, if you being evil, in other words, a fallen creation, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does God delight in giving to his children when they ask? He says, basically, if you who do not have what I have are able and wanting to show love to your children by giving them good things. How do you think God that has everything is going to respond to giving his children good things? Folks, we need to understand that God is ready to give us those things that are beneficial to us. Now notice that word I said, beneficial. Not everything that we ask for is beneficial. Amen? How, do you, how many of you remember, was it the Christmas story with the Red Ryder BB gun? Wasn't that the name of it? What did they tell them? The little boy wanted that Red Ryder BB gun. And they wouldn't buy it for him. Why? Because you'll shoot your eye out. In other words, it wasn't beneficial to him, okay? They didn't think he could handle it. Didn't think, and by the way, he got it, and what happened? He shot it. Well, he didn't shoot his eye out, but he thought he shot his eye out. <coughs> so it leads us to ask, what things are beneficial? Well, those things that help us grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, those are beneficial. That's what we need. Those things that will draw us closer to God. Those things that will teach us more about God. 
Those are the things that we need. I don't know about you, but I'm not living for this world. I'm living for the world to come. And so since I'm living for the world to come and I'm waiting for that day that I get to see Jesus face to face, I want to know more and more and more and more about him. And I want to be better and better and better prepared to meet him. Amen? So those things that he can give me to help that along, those are beneficial. Number two, those things that help us accomplish the task that God has put us here to do. Folks, remember, God put us here that we might honor and glorify Him and that we, we might spread His message to the world. So those things that He gives us that we might accomplish that, those are things that are beneficial. How many have a vehicle? <coughs> now, it might not be the one you wanted, it might not be your dream car, but you have one, amen? And listen to me, God provided it for you. How many know it's beneficial? Got you here this morning, didn't it? I'm, I'm looking at a few of y'all pretty, pretty good little ways out. You would not be here this morning if you didn't have a vehicle. That's a long walk, amen? So God gave it to you. It's beneficial. It gets you into his house so that you're able to come and worship with fellow believers. Now, before we just start rubbing that genie in the bottle, let me give you some requirements to receiving that promise that God has promised us. We need to remember that we need to, as we study Scripture, we always need to interpret Scripture from the context of Scripture. In other words, we can't just take this passage and pull it out. If we just take this passage, we yank it out, it says, look, God's going to do everything we want him to do. Amen? You know what it said? If we ask, he's going to give it. If we seek, we're going to find it. If we knock, it's going to be open. So God's going to do anything that we ask him to do, God's going to do it. If, if we just took that and yanked it out of there. But we need to look at the whole teaching of the Bible before we run off with one verse or one passage. And I think there's some key passages we need to consider alongside of this in order to understand exactly what Jesus is promising here in Matthew chapter 7. I think one of those we find over in the book of James chapter 1 verses 5 through 7. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without re reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one that doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person <coughs> must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Number one, we need to ask in faith. We need to ask believing God's going to answer it. How many of you know that will change the things that you ask for? Now, your children, you want to provide for them as much as possible, amen? Most of you? All right, so your children are going to go home today and say, Dad, Mom, I need a million dollars. How many know they're not going to ask that? You know why? Because there's no faith that you're going to be able to give it because they know you don't have it. So if we're going to ask in faith, we need to ask knowing that God can provide these things. And there's just some things that we could ask God for that we know God's not going to say yes to. Amen? So we're not asking in faith. We're asking in hope, maybe, but we're not asking in faith. Well, later in the book of James, in James chapter 4, verse 3, he says, You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. In other words, he says, you ask for things, but the reason that you're asking is the wrong reason. He said, because you want to use it for you. <coughs> How many need a Lamborghini? How many know asking God for a Lamborghini is not a need for you? Now, by the way, he might give it to you. He might, I don't know. But it's the wrong thing to ask for. We're supposed to ask for those things that please God and that help us be pleasing to God. Now, let me add one more passage there for you in 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. 
It says, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we will know <coughs> that we have the request that we have asked of him. Ask in faith. Number two, ask in his will. God's not going to give us things that are against his will. God's not going to let us live against his will and him be a part of it. You know, again, going back to because he put this, this, this child thing, your child comes up and says, hey, Dad, I need to borrow the car tonight. I'm robbing a bank. I bet you don't give him the keys. I see some of you thinking, going, I wonder if he'll get away with it. <laughs> Son, if you give me half. No, we're not going to do that. Why? Because we know that's not the will. That's not what they should be doing. And so when we ask things of God, and we need to ask that his will be done. You will hear me oftentimes pray, especially when I'm praying over those that are, that are sick and, and, and even facing possibly death. So, Lord, we might not understand it, but we want your will to be done. Bring our will into your will. Because not everything that we want is what God wants. So yes, persistence is the precept, but motivation is the key. Why are we praying? Why are we asking? Why are we seeking? Why are we knocking? Church, we have a heavenly father who is not untouched by the persistent pleas of his children. He hears us. Provided that we ask with the right motive, persistent prayers will not go unanswered. Maybe now is a good time to remind you that answered prayer does not mean that you're always going to receive the answer that you want. I am one of those, I believe that God answers every prayer. How many have a prayer that God hadn't answered? Anybody got a prayer God hadn't answered? Y'all been sticking around long enough to know that's a trick question, isn't you? I believe that God answers every single prayer. How many realize no is an answer? It's not one we like to hear, but no is an answer, right? I mean, anytime you're filling out a questionnaire, it says yes or no. No is an answer, okay? If you'll remember Jesus in the garden, he said, uh, Father, let this cup pass. He said, but nevertheless, let not my will be done, but your will be done. Now, did the cup pass? In other words, did he escape the cross? No. So God answered his prayer. His answer was what? No. Sometimes the answer we get is grow. There are some things we're just not ready to handle spiritually. There are some things God knows if he gave it to us, we couldn't handle it. We'd make a mess of it. And so we need to grow spiritually before God will give us the answer to that, that that we're desiring to have. And sometimes the answer is slow. Sometimes God's ready to answer your prayer, but he wants you to be patient. You know, how many in your younger years prayed for the perfect person, the perfect spouse? And then you met that one and you knew that was it, right? God gave you all three answers at one time. He said, no, grow, and slow, didn't he? I think it was an old Garth Brooks song or something that said that sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. How many of you sitting here today, you, you, you're glad today that God didn't give you what you asked for? I can tell you right here, amen for me. I, I think on occasion on different folks that I dated before I was sold out for God, and, and I don't see them being preacher's wives. <laughs> So sometimes God says slow. Sometimes says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find you the right person, God says, but you need to be patient. You need to wait for me. You need to wait for me to show you. You know, because the, the problem that we have today is people jump in it too fast. I was talking with Peggy earlier. She said, how many people do you know that have been married for 57 years? I was like, if I do, they're older. Why? Because 57 is old. And I'm going to guess you was at least 15 before you got married, I hope, you know, maybe 18 or 20. So that puts you on up there. 
You know, how many, how many people here have been married more than 50 years? Raise your hand. All right. Y'all me. Let y'all in a secret. I turn 51 next month. Y'all old. I ain't been alive as long as you've been married. So the reason we don't see that today, number one, is because most people aren't that old yet. But number two, marriages don't last that long. Why? Because we jumped in it because that's what we wanted. We didn't seek what God wanted. So he says slow. And then that last answer, this is the one we all love, that last answer is go. In other words, God says, yes, here you go, have it. Can I get an amen on that one? I know that's the one we like to hear, but, but he answers, right? No, grow, slow, and go. They're all answers, aren't they? So the question is, how bad do you want your prayer answered? Are you willing to persevere? Are you willing to be persistent? Are you willing to ask and keep on asking? You know, the Bible also says you don't have it because you haven't asked for it. So the first thing we have to do is we've got to ask for it. He said, well, God knows everything. He sure does, but he also wants you to ask for it so that you know that you're dependent upon him. So are you willing to ask and keep on asking? Are you willing to seek and keep on seeking? Are you willing to knock and keep on knocking? Let's face it, there are prayers that we've been praying for years, and sometimes the devil has tried to get us to give up on it. Some of you have been praying for loved ones for years that they'd get saved or that they'd return to the Lord. You've been praying, you've been praying, you've been praying, you've been persistent, and the devil keeps trying to say, just give up, it's of no use, just quit, don't even worry about it anymore. The question is, are you willing to keep on asking and seeking and knocking? And by the way, while we're practicing perseverance and persistence in our prayer life, let's let that carry over to every other aspect of our spiritual life. Let that happen in our Bible study. Let's keep on studying. Let's study and keep on studying. Uh, in our service opportunity, let's start serving and keep on serving. There's a lot of places, even in a church our size, there's a lot of places people could serve if they want to serve. The problem is most people don't want to serve. Most people are content with coming there one hour on Sunday morning thinking they've done something for God. You know, then some of them, you throw an extra hour on Wednesday night just, to, just for good graces. What are you doing with the rest of that time God's giving you? How much of that are you using to serve Him? I get it all the time in a church. <coughs> I invite people to church and, what, what kind of programs do you have? What kind of this do you have? What kind? Well, you know what you got to have to have programs? People. you got to have people that will attend them and people that will run them. Until you get that, it ain't going to happen. I have people say, do you have a team group? I said, well, we raise them up and then they go somewhere else. <laughs> we get them to teens. <coughs> and then they go <coughs> run off these churches that have all these multiple programs. And I tell people, I don't mind telling people. I say, it doesn't have to be your kid, but somebody's got to be the first. Amen? You're not going to have a group until somebody shows up. So are you willing to serve and to keep on serving? And then are you willing to evangelize and keep on evangelizing? People need the Lord every single day. You're going to run into somebody that needs God. You, you, it's not a quota. You can check off, hey, I shared the gospel once this week. No, you need to share the gospel every opportunity that you get. So, folks, are we willing to be persistent? There's some of you this morning, you've got some things on your heart that you've been praying for for a long time. Or you've got some things that you prayed for for a long time and you're really not faithfully praying for them anymore. You've given up. You've somewhere jumped off the bus of persistence. Are you willing to say to God this morning, God, I want this prayer answered so much that I'm willing to ask and keep on asking. I'm willing to seek and keep on seeking. I'm willing to knock and keep on knocking. Maybe it's for that loved one or friend that needs to know Jesus for the first time, that needs to be saved. Maybe that's one that's drifted away and you're praying for them to come back. Maybe it's something in your life. You're, you're looking for guidance and direction. Are you willing to bring it to Christ? Start it this morning. And the only way that's going to happen is if we trust him. 
In just a moment, Sam's going to come and play trust and obey. That's the only way that we will become people that ask and seek and knock is if we trust the one that we're asking. How many of you know that we serve a good, good God? A loving God. One that wants to answer your prayer if you'll ask for the right motive and ask in the right way. Will you come this morning? Father, we love you and praise you. Thank you again for the day that you've given. Thank you for the opportunity that we've had in your house and in your word this morning. Lord, teach us, convict us to be people of persistence. Lord, to not give up on those prayers that, Lord, it seems like we've been praying for years and we don't see any answers. Help us to keep on praying. Help us to keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. And Father, we know that you're faithful. And when it's your time and your will, you'll give us the answers that we need. Help us, Lord, to sometimes realize that answer may be no. Sometimes we're just asking for the wrong things. Sometimes that answer may be grow. We, we need to grow spiritually. We're not ready to receive what we've been asking for. Sometimes that answer will be slow. Lord, we need to wait on your timing, Lord, and not push our timing upon you. Father, some are going to come to this altar this morning and the answer is going to be go. They're going to turn it over to you, Lord. And Father, you're going to give them the green light. So Father, help us. Help us to be people of prayer. Persistent prayer. We'll praise you for it in Christ's name. Amen.